from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all and welcome to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast devoted to figurative sculpture and to figurative sculptors working around the world. I am your host, Jason Arkles, a sculptor and educator living and working in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead and I don't feel so well myself. And today, we continue our series of profiles of American sculptors who trained in Europe in the 19th century with Augustus St. Gaudens. Augustus St. Gaudens is regarded by many to have been the greatest figurative sculptor the United States has produced, and I tend to agree. There may be more recognizable works by American sculptors out there, like the Lincoln Memorial by Daniel Chester French, and naturally the Mount Rushmore Memorial by Goodson Borglum, and certainly both French and Borglum were excellent sculptors. There's Hiram Powers as well, with his famous and charming Greek slave. But if I had to pick one sculptor whose work I consider worthy of ranking against some of the greatest sculptors in the Western tradition, someone who wasn't merely talented or popular or successful, but who revealed true artistic greatness and wielded significant influence with artists who followed him, it would have to be Augustus St. Gaudens. In fact, after starting preparations for this episode, I realized that I really can't do his life, his work, and his influence justice in just one episode. So this is going to be a two-part biography. Now, I've only done this for a handful of sculptors like Donatello, Rodin, Carpo. I think I did five episodes for Michelangelo. But now, does that mean that I think that Augustus St. Gaudens belongs in the pantheon of the truly great masters? Well, not exactly. I mean, Augustus St. Gaudens was no Donatello, nor was he a Carpo, but St. Gaudens' life and work touches almost every aspect of American sculpture in the second half of the 19th century. Where and how sculptors trained, the sorts of work they made, the styles which evolved during that time, the major events which affected and were affected by American sculpture, Augustus St. Gaudens and his work lies at the heart of it all. So, to understand Augustus St. Gaudens, we need to be familiar with many related topics, from the École de Beaux-Arts to the American Beaux-Arts style, to the City Beautiful movement, from the American Civil War to the Chicago World's Fair, from developments in low-relief sculpture to developments in architecture. I'll be touching upon all of this, as Augustus St. Gaudens' life and work does too, and even a brief explanation of everything will take two episodes, so let's get right to it. Augustus St. Gaudens was born in Dublin, Ireland, in 1848, but his parents emigrated to the United States when Augustus was just six months old. He was the son of an itinerant shoemaker from France who had met Augustus's mother in a shoe factory in Dublin. He emigrated his family to the United States because, like so many others who made that same trip, he was escaping the famine raging through Ireland, and he sought a better life for his family. And like so many others, he made his family's home in New York City. Augustus's father made a decent living in New York, as French footwear fashions were all the rage at the time. The family was bilingual at home and interacted with the colony of French immigrants in New York as well. The children of the St. Gaudens family had always been encouraged to pursue their interests, and Augustus' interest lay in the arts. And when Augustus turned 13 in 1861, he was apprenticed to a French cameo cutter named Louis Ave. Now, cameo cutting... It's not so well known these days, and it hardly springs to mind when people today discuss the various genres in which a sculptor might work. But in the 19th century, it was a popular, even thriving art form. A cameo is a stone or a piece of shell or glass or a gemstone that's carved with a relief. Now, what makes this different from other relief is that the material being used, whether shell, stone, or whatever, it's got different layers of color naturally occurring in the material. So, for instance, a shell might be pink on the inside and white on the outside, and so you carve back the white material and, and you get to a pink layer, right? Now, the art of cameo cutting utilizes this color change by having the relief, the part that sticks out from the background, consist of material in one colored layer, while the background is carved deeply enough to exhibit the other color. 
A very common color scheme to be found in cameos is having a white relief on a blue background, and that's often found in layered agate cameos, for example, or white and pink in, in shells, as I mentioned. Now, it's a meticulous, tedious, and finicky process to create a cameo, on top of the already difficult tasks of working in relief and in miniature. But they had become popular in the 19th century, equivalent to a studio portrait photograph in the 20th century, and perhaps maybe the selfie in the 21st. Cameos were more affordable compared to oil paintings or portrait busts. They were portable, and they made great gifts to friends, family, and loved ones. Now, this early rigorous training in very low relief would serve Augustus St. Gaudens very well in his future career, as we will see. And young Augustus seemed to show a competence for this exacting craft. After three years with his first master cutting stone cameos, Augustus St. Gaudens finds employment with a shell cameo cutter, who was another member of the French expats living in New York, for whom he worked another three years. And it was during this time, this second three-year period, that Augustus St. Gaudens started attending drawing classes at the Cooper Union and then at the National Academy of Design. It was there that he first drew from the antique, as well as drawing from the nude. Now, Augustus St. Gaudens' teenage years, spent as a cameo cutter's apprentice in New York, played out against a cultural backdrop which would forever influence his life and his later career. In 1861, the year Augustus St. Gaudens began his apprenticeship, civil war erupted in the United States, pitting brother against brother in the battle over the issue of slavery and the power struggle between federal and state governments. Although the fighting itself didn't reach New York City, apart from a few draft riots, Augustus St. Gaudens was a personal witness to history in the form of President Abraham Lincoln, twice. Augustus got a glimpse of Lincoln as he was leaving for his inauguration in 1860, when Augustus was just 12 years old, and he saw him again five years later lying in state in New York City Hall after having been assassinated. The 17-year-old was moved enough by the experience to have waited hours in line to view Lincoln's body not once but twice before Lincoln's funeral train continued on its tour of states before burial. The Civil War, the issues which gave rise to it, and its aftermath affected everyone living in the U.S. during those times, and Augustus St. Gaudens was no exception on both a personal and professional level. The commemoration of the Civil War and of Abraham Lincoln would form a significant portion of Augustus St. Gaudens' future commissions. But these six years as a cameo cutter and his evening drawing classes were all just a preparation for what came next. In 1867, Augustus St. Gaudens traveled to Paris to attend the Paris Universal Exposition, the World's Fair showcasing the arts, industries, and agriculture of the 42 nations participating in it. And I'll talk a little bit more about World's Fairs in an upcoming podcast, but for now, it's enough to know that Basically, before mass media, World's Fairs were the place to go to see what was the latest thing in everything, from new inventions and machinery to agricultural innovations to groundbreaking art. Augustus's father had saved $100 from Augustus's apprenticeship wages, and with additional money from his employer, Augustus St. Gaudens spent the summer absorbing all that the fair and that Paris had to offer. But his real goal, apparently kept secret from family and employer, was to try to enter the École de Beaux-Arts, to which he attempted to enter on his second day in Paris. Let's take a moment to reflect upon Paris in 1867 and place the young Augustus St. Gaudens in the context of some other things I've discussed in other episodes. In 1867, France was at the height of the Second Empire, ruled by the Emperor Napoleon III, who was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. The Second Empire is remembered for its excesses, a decadent time which celebrated fashion and frivolty, but under which lay the seeds for a civil war, which would erupt a few short years later in the aftermath of the crisis of the Franco-Prussian War. In art, the liberality of the times allowed for artists to explore the passions and individualism as promoted by followers of the Romantic movement. The sculptor Jean-Baptiste Carpeau had shown his famous Ugolino and his sons at the Paris Salon just a few years earlier, 
which marked a real sea change away from the late neoclassicism, still officially favored by the National Academy in Paris, which of course was the governing artistic body which oversaw the École, the Prix de Rome, and the French Academy in Rome. And it was just two years after Augustus' arrival that Carpeau would eventually unveil his dance on the Paris Opera, a sculpture that would shock and titillate the public, but eventually become to be seen as a monument of vivacious naturalism, a masterpiece of French sculpture. Now, in the Universal Exposition of 1867, which is what the Paris World's Fair was called, Augustus St. Gaudens was profoundly affected by another groundbreaking sculptor, Paul Dubois, best remembered today as the leading sculptor of the Neo-Florentine movement. On display that summer was his Florentine Singer, his best-known work, as well as his Young St. John. Now, the Neo-Florentines were interested in a more naturalistic approach to the human figure, one without any reliance on the centuries-old tradition of the classical ideal, and for historical precedent they turned to the early Florentine Renaissance, to the time before Michelangelo had impacted the art world with his Neoplatonic ideals and his classicizing muscularity and all that that would spawn. Now, that's just a very brief and incomplete look at Paris in 1867. And for a more complete picture of sculpture at the time, I would suggest that you listen back to several episodes which center on this fascinating, fascinating time, one of my favorite periods in art history. And if you listen to episodes 21 through 26, you will be filled in on what you need to know about Romanticism, about the sculptors who led that movement, and as well as how the École de Beaux-Arts functioned. So, after arriving in Paris and finding out that in order to study at the École, Augustus needed to file a formal application at the American consulate, a process which took more than half a year to complete, he got a job cutting cameos in a Parisian studio, and he also enrolled in classes at the École Gratuite de Design, or Free Drawing School, which is also popularly known as the Petite École. Now, the Petite École was intended for the artistic education of tradesmen and designers and decorators and apprentices of various sorts, and its teaching was regarded as very good, enough to attract students of the fine arts as well. Carpeau, Jules Deleu, and Rodin all studied there, as did many others, using it sometimes as a prep school of sorts, before eventually applying to the École de Beaux-Arts. In the Petite École, Augustus St. Gaudens modeled from the nude in clay for the first time, but he apparently was a natural. He won two first-place awards for his work in the first six months he was there, and he was good enough to be accepted into Francois Jouffroy's atelier. Now, Jouffroy was one of the principal instructors at the École de Beaux-Arts, one of the older establishment who practiced the official French academic style, which of course is rooted in neoclassicism, though he was a practitioner of excellent taste as far as the style allowed, and by all accounts he was a passionate and intelligent teacher who allowed his students to develop their own voice. Now he was no upstart in the tradition of Rude or Carpeau, but neither was he opposed to innovation. Jouffroy's students frequently won the Prix de Rome, and Augustus St. Gaudens was happy to study under him, though he seems not to have been a particularly distinguished student. But Augustus felt right at home in Paris, being of French descent and fluent in that language, and that set him apart from the more typical American students studying at the École. There weren't many Americans at all studying sculpture at the École in the late 1860s, and I imagine the Civil War in the United States had something to do with that. The first American to study there at the École in any capacity was the architect Richard Morris Hunt, just two decades before Augustus St. Gaudens got in. Most of Augustus St. Gaudens' friends were Frenchmen, and when the Franco-Prussian War broke out in 1870, he almost joined in the fight for the cause of France. Instead, though, Augustus St. Gaudens left France for Rome. Now, every student of the École de Beaux-Arts dreams of winning the Prix du Rome, a five-year, all-expenses-paid trip to Rome to study at the Académie de France, which was sort of the École de Beaux-Arts' graduate school for all its top students. But the Prix du Rome was closed to foreigners, Frenchmen only, and Augustus St. Gaudens therefore never had a chance to compete for it, much less win it. And so, 
Augustus used the excuse of the war in France to indulge in all that Rome had to offer. He took a studio near the Palazzo Barberini and became acquainted with the large American expatriate clan of artists already there in Rome, as well as the last several years' winners of the Prix de Rome now studying at the Académie de France. Inspired by what was going on with the students at the Académie de France, Augustus St. Gaudens set himself a task in emulation of the Prix de Rome winners. He was to complete a life-sized statue. But the work of the students of the École de Beaux-Arts was not the only influence on Augustus St. Gaudens at this time. The American presence in Rome and the sculpture that the American expat community had been producing over the last decades also had an impact on what he chose to sculpt. The uniquely American sculpture being produced at the time included subjects taken from literature and poetry, as well as from distinctly American themes, such as the Native American, a theme tackled with more or less success by Horatio Greeno and Thomas Crawford and others before him. Now, Augustus St. Gaudens' first life-size figure followed this pattern. He modeled a figure of Hiawatha, an American Indian who was celebrated in a recent poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Longfellow, in fact, had just recently concluded an extended visit to Rome, and I have to imagine that the choice of Hiawatha was a calculation on Augustus St. Gaudens' part, riding on the coattails of Longfellow's visit and his famous poem, in order that it might be purchased. Augustus St. Gaudens' Hiawatha fits pretty well within the genre of mid-century Americans' sculpture produced in Rome although it is immediately evident, when comparing it to other male nudes made by his fellow expats, that the author of this work has enjoyed a French academic training. The figure is done in the neoclassical style only really in spirit, and in its composition, and its details like the little quiver of arrows, but the figure itself is a well-rendered, well-observed academic figure study, rather than the soft, generalized idealizations common to most Roman American work. Now, to illustrate the difference, we can compare it with Thomas Crawford's statue, entitled The Indian Chief Contemplating the Progress of Civilization, made in 1856, just 15 years earlier than St. Gaudens' statue. They are both seated male nudes, and they are both rather Europeanized versions of a Native American, and they both attempt to elicit from the viewer very similar sentiments. But the handling of the bodies themselves is significantly different. Crawford's is an ideal type, muscular and mannered, with proportions suggesting a mathematical or constructed approach rather than one taken from observation of life, while with St. Gaudens, despite the ham-fisted attempt to make the face and the hair more Indian-ish, the figure is a master class of the seated male figure study. I've got images of both of these works up at thesculptorsfuneral.com so you can compare them yourself. Just click on the image gallery banner link on the homepage and scroll down to episode 65 to see these and other images of Augustus St. Gaudens' work. Augustus St. Gaudens' calculations with his Hiawatha paid off, and he found a patron who was willing to pay for the casting of the clay model into plaster, and this same patron also commissioned portraits of his children from Augustus. And just like that, Augustus St. Gaudens career was launched. We'll hear where his path leads him next when the sculptor's funeral continues. Hey everyone, I want to give a huge thank you to all the people who have contributed logo ideas for the sculptor's funeral in the last two weeks. They are all great. Seriously, I want a, I want a coffee mug collection of every design. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your work on this guys. It's, it's really great. Um, and if you are hearing about this for the first time and you don't know what I'm talking about, let me tell you. I have put out a call for a logo for the sculptor's funeral because I stink at logos and graphic design, and many of you obviously do not. Now, the idea is to upload these logos to redbubble.com, which is a website where they will take your logo and print it on whatever you want from coffee mugs, cell phone cases, tote bags, scarves, hoodies, etc., and so if you wanted, say, a, a nice set of official Sculptor's Funeral pajamas, like I do, all you have to do is order them from the Sculptor's Funeral store at redbubble.com once that is up and running. Uh, so if you, if you haven't sent in a logo and you want to, all you need to do is post your awesome artwork 
to the Facebook group page, or if you prefer, you can email it to me directly at the Sculptor's Funeral, all one word, the Sculptor's Funeral at gmail.com, and I will post it for you so we can all take a look. Now, I was thinking of just choosing one logo, but there have been several different logos submitted that are just fantastic, and each one gives off kind of a different flavor, kind of a different facet to the complex organism that is the Sculptor's Funeral. So I'm definitely going to choose uh, several. So let me know which, uh, which are your favorites by your comments and your likes on the Facebook page. And if your logo gets picked, not only will your designs grace my newest coffee mug, but you'll also get a royalty check for your hard work. Profits are going to be split by the Sculptor's Funeral and the creators of the logos 50-50. And who knows, your royalties may add up to literally tens of dollars someday. But of course, you're not doing it for the money, are you? No, you're doing it because you love the podcast and you want to be a part of it. And you can check out the cool designs that have already been submitted at the Sculptor's Funeral Facebook group page. And so far, I want to thank Annie, Michael, Gregory, and Robert for their submissions. Uh, Check them out, guys. They're really great. I, I put them all in an album on the Facebook group page so you can view them all side by side. Thanks again, guys. I cannot wait for my new coffee mugs. So, with the statue of Hiawatha, Augustus St. Gaudens achieved a little positive notice in Rome, which attracted a few wealthy American patrons passing through Rome on the Grand Tour. They commissioned Augustus for portrait busts and copies of classical works in marble. And in these early works, we can take note of a few characteristics which would become trademarks of Augustus St. Gaudens' later work. For one, He has an incredibly delicate touch and does not shy away from ephemeral effects in stone. In the lace neckline of a portrait bust of one young woman, the lace lifts off the chest ever so slightly, catching light and becoming a little bit translucent. Now, for someone who hadn't spent six years cutting tiny portraits into gemstones and seashells, this would have been a tricky and laborious way to render uh, what could have been a simple neckline but it appears fairly effortless for Augustus St. Gaudens, and it has the effect of lightening the feel of the entire bust. Another St. Gaudens trademark we find on the portrait bust of a friend, a young woman named Eva Rohr, who was studying singing and opera in Rome. Augustus renders her portrait dressed as her role in an opera she was in at the time, and into the base of the bust, Augustus inscribes her operatic character's opening lines. The inclusion of inscriptions was nothing new in sculpture, but usually they consist of the signature of the artist, or the name, the dates, or other identification of the subject, or or maybe a commemorative inscription. But here, we have Augustus St. Gaudens adding something whose purpose is to deepen our understanding of the work beyond identification. The inscription provides an illusional context in which to view the bust. Now, the inclusion of text within a sculpture will become, as I say, a hallmark of his art, as would his very distinctive decorative lettering style. Augustus St. Gaudens was in Rome only for a few years before he returned, briefly, to the United States. His return was prompted by his contracting the Roman fever, which is what the locals called malaria. He traveled back to New York to recuperate at the home of his parents in 1872 at the age of 24. Now, once he recovered, he got right back into cameo cutting in New York, but he also received several marble portrait commissions. And he also received his first commissioned figure from the local chapter of the Freemasons to which his father belonged. This was to be a statue of silence, a fitting emblem for the Freemasons. So he returns to Rome because Italy, of course, is where the marble is. He takes up his old studio and he gets to work. Soon after his return, he was also commissioned for a copy of his Hiawatha in marble by the wealthy American and former New York governor, Edwin Morgan. And to top off this very successful trip back to Rome, Augustus St. Gaudens meets his future wife, Augusta Homer, a young American studying abroad in Rome. So, yeah, her name is Augusta Homer, Augustus and Augusta. They were engaged after three months, uh, but there was one catch. Augusta came from a very well-to-do old New England family, and before Augusta's parents would consent to have their daughter marry the son of a shoemaker, Augustus St. Gaudens must prove himself by receiving a major commission first. So in 1875, 
Augustus St. Gaudens returns to the United States after completing his work in Rome. He opens a studio there, and he tries everything imaginable to land a large commission that would not only set up his career in the United States, but also enable him to marry his true love. So first, he competes for a commemorative statue of Charles Sumner, the abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, but that gets awarded to an older, more experienced sculptor, Thomas Ball, who lived and worked in Florence. Undaunted, Augustus next enters into competition for a commemorative statue of David Farragut for the city of New York. Now, David Farragut was the first admiral of the U.S. Navy, and he served during the Civil War, mostly remembered today for having uttered the phrase, damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead. Now, just like the commission for Charles Sumner, the Farragut Commission was part of a vigorous movement in the 1870s and 1880s to commemorate the heroes of the Civil War, which ended in 1865. Now, today, there isn't a city of any size in America that doesn't have some sort of memorial commemorating the fallen soldiers of the war between the states. And as terrible as the Civil War had been, it has to be said that it was a bit of a bonanza for American sculptors both European-trained and sculptors who had learned their craft on American soil. All these Civil War statues was a bit of a windfall for American sculptors, and it was to set the stage for the blossoming of American sculpture in the last years of the 19th century, as these Civil War monuments sustained many a career and encouraged aspiring younger artists to pursue the craft as well. Now, Augustus St. Gaudens did everything in his power to land the Farragut Commission, getting his important patrons like the former governor to put in a good word for him. He created sketches and portrait studies and scale models, and, and in the end, it came down to two competitors, Augustus St. Gaudens and John Quincy Adams Ward, an older, more experienced sculptor with a half a dozen Civil War commissions already under his belt, including one at Gettysburg. Ward had also served as president of the National Academy of Design, sort of the American equivalent to the Royal Academy in London or the National Academy in Paris. Pretty stiff competition for Augustus St. Gaudens. And in fact, the committee awarded the Farragut Memorial to John Quincy Adams Ward, six votes to five. However, the decision was made at a particularly busy time for Ward, who then declined the commission, and so finally it went to Augustus. Now, getting the Farragut Commission happened in 1876, but this was far from the only thing Augustus St. Gaudens had on his plate at the time. The years 1875 and 1876 see Augustus going in a hundred different directions at once, all of which bore fruit in some form, and some of these experiences would have lasting significance for the rest of his career. For one, he was hired to assist with the decorative scheme for Trinity Church in Boston, playing initially a very minor role, but this work put him in touch with an association of artists and architects at the top of their game in the United States, which widened his professional circle of associates considerably. He worked with and became friends with the painter John Lafarge, whose murals for the church would establish his reputation, as well as the architect of the church, Henry Richardson. Now, Trinity Church made Richardson one of the leading architects of the day. And Trinity Church itself is one of the most beautiful and artistically important structures in the United States, which eventually included stained glass by William Morris and Edward Byrne Jones, sculpture by Daniel Chester French, and Augusta St. Gaudens, who was, a little later, given the commission of sculpting a Reredos for the church. Now, a Reredos is sort of like a screen or a backdrop for the high altar in a church, and it's made of wood or bronze or marble, and it's usually richly decorated. Now, Augustus's circle of professional acquaintances was expanded further by his joining the newly formed Society of American Artists, a small group of progressive artists who were dissatisfied by the conservative tastes of the National Academy of Design. Now, this new rebellious society was just like what happened in London or in Paris earlier in the century. You always get this, uh, this sort of cycle of progressives banding together and offering themselves as an alternative to the established order. Augustus St. Gaudens was prompted to join after the National Academy of Design refused one of his works for their annual exhibitions. But the Society of American Artists wasn't just a collection of lesser talents who were refused entry into exhibitions. 
but also included more progressive ones and successful ones, including the likes of Louis Tiffany and John Lafarge, and eventually many members of the National Academy of Design itself also held membership in the Society of American Artists. And finally, Augustus St. Gaudens, at this time, became lifelong friends with two young architects, up-and-comers in their field by the name of Charles McKim and Stanford White. And their friendship and professional collaboration would eventually lead to changing the face of American architecture and sculpture in the final decades of the 19th century. But we'll get to that later. All these new professional and personal associations led to almost immediate opportunities for Augustus, in addition to the Reredos of Trinity Church, he was given the commission of two different family tombs. He was commissioned for another Reredos in another church, another monument to another naval figure as well, this one for the Sailor's Snug Harbor for retired seamen. Basically, he was given years and years worth of work. With all this, Augustus St. Gaudens seems to have convinced his fiancée's parents that he was the real deal, and he and Augusta were married and they left America for Paris soon after, to set up a home and a studio there. Now, it may seem strange that the first thing Augustus St. Gaudens did when given these commissions was to leave the country, but the level of foundry work and Brown's casting in the United States was considered subpar for important work, and so off to Paris they went. Augustus St. Gaudens is in Europe on this trip from 1877 to 1880, where he completes his commissions, including the Admiral Farragut statue, and even exhibits it at the Paris Salon, where it's received pretty well. In addition, he is joined by his architect friends, Stanford White and Charles McKim, and together the three explore the museums and architecture of Paris, and even make a side trip to Rome as well, developing ideas for future collaboration between sculptor and architects, including having Stanford White design the architectural base for Augustus's Admiral Farragut. It's also at this time that Augustus St. Gaudens begins to explore relief work in bronze. Starting out by doing mostly reliefs and medallions of friends and family, but later expanding into commissioned work, Augustus St. Gaudens pursued relief work professionally and as a private enjoyment for the rest of his life. Now, at this point, I want to take a time out from his biography to talk a little bit more about his relief work specifically, on its own, because his achievements in relief are well worth a digression and practically worth a podcast of their own. So the first thing I should mention is that Augustus's uh, relief work derives from the French tradition of medallic arts rather from a Beaux-Arts or neoclassical source. And what this means is that Augustus St. Gaudens' reliefs are not akin to the Parthenon frieze or Trajan's column or the Arc de Triomphe or most relief work meant to decorate the facades of architecture. Rather, his sources derive from medals, medallions, coins, smaller commemorative work done in cast metal. Now, this sort of work is kind of the sister art to the practice of cameo cutting, which he had already mastered. But specifically, Augustus was looking at the work of a few French masters, namely Henri Chapoux and David Danger. Now, David Danger, you may remember from the podcast episode on Francois Rude. David Danger was the sculptor and instructor at the École de Beaux-Arts in Paris who dies and whose masterless atelier had petitioned Rude to become their new master. The students felt that only Francois Rude was capable of continuing the vigorous, naturalistic approach to modeling that David Danger had introduced to them. Well, that vigorous, naturalistic style of David Danger isn't very apparent in his larger works, which seem pretty neoclassical, but it is a hallmark of his work in medallions. And he had made hundreds of medallions, in fact, all portraits done from life, forming a collection that he called The Great Men of France. In fact, David Danger almost single-handedly revived the medallic arts in France by this collection of work, expanding the notion of what metals could be, what forms they could take, and even how they were made. For one thing, as they were works of a personal commemorative type and not official coin that needed to be mass-produced, the modeling in the relief could be left a little fresher and unpolished, especially as regards the inscriptions on the metals which more resembled personal handwriting rather than a standardized font. 
the inscriptions could be large and even occupy as much space as the portrait on some of these works. Or like in some Roman precedents, there could be a double or even multiple portraits on the same metal. Basically, just a lot of creativity and exploration that hadn't been seen in medallion work uh, probably since the Renaissance. But what really sets David d'Angers' medals apart was that they were not struck, like coins, but cast, like any other bronze sculpture. Now, typically, a coin or medal is made from a steel die. Now imagine the negative relief of a coin engraved into, literally carved into, a steel stamp. Now this stamp, or die, is then used to stamp the relief into softer metals to make the, to make the reproductions. Now what this means is that the subtlety of the modeling in the relief is only as subtle as the process of cutting that relief into a steel die allows. Now to be sure, it does allow for a lot but it falls a little short of really capturing the sketchy thumbprint qualities of a good modeler, the way bronze casting does. Many sculptors, inspired by Danger, turned their hand to the genre of medallion work, and medallions became fashionable to commission like any other form of portraiture. The sculptor Henri Chapu took David Danger's ideas even further, softening edges and leaving an undulating background plane to some of his relief work which implies a sense of atmosphere akin to some of Donatello's Stacciato relief from the 1400s. So basically, in a nutshell, medallions and coins are taking off in new and unexpected ways, full of invention and creativity. And when Augustus St. Gaudens was in Paris in the late 1870s, he studied the works of Henri Chapu and David d'Angers, and he produced several relief portraits in Paris before returning to the States in 1880. Throughout his career, his large monuments, even, would often incorporate relief work and inscriptions rendered in the style of these smaller, more intimate portraits. But it's his portraits in relief and his commemorative medals which have influenced generations of American medalists and workers in relief right up to the present day. Let's take a look at a few portrait reliefs of Augustus's in detail. And let me just say, it was really difficult to limit myself to talking about just two of his reliefs. I have an entire book devoted to them, and there are a dozen easy that are just absolutely standout works. And I'll post a bunch of these on the image gallery for this episode, again, episode number 65, so check them out at thesculptorsfuneral.com. So the first relief I want to talk about uh, is one of his most characteristic, I guess you could say, a relief that has the flavor of Augustus St. Gaudens all over it. And that is the portrait relief of his friend, the author Robert Louis Stevenson. Stevenson battled with illness all of his life, and he was considered an invalid, despite his prolific writing and his prolific travel. Now, Augustus St. Gaudens' portrait of Stevenson depicts him propped up by several pillows in bed and smoking. Uh, so yeah, a relief of a guy smoking in bed. It's, it's awesome. Uh, the, the intimacy this pose suggests is indicative of Augustus St. Gaudens' desire to make portrait relief work as spontaneous and expressive and as personal as painted portraits could be. There are several versions of this relief of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, and the earlier ones are rectangular. But it proved to be a popular seller, and he produced, and Augustus St. Gaudens produces a large medallion, sort of a circular medallion version of it as well, about three feet in diameter, and he also produced reductions of it. Now, nearly all these versions were retouched and, and modified slightly, but all of them include sort of the same uh, features. Basically, they'll all have a, a, some sort of decorative border of foliage, roughly and informally sketched in. And the background plane above Stevenson's bed is filled with a lengthy inscription, which is actually a Stevenson poem, which touches on the theme of death. The modeling in this relief is very low for a life-sized relief. It's less than two centimeters in depth. But Augustus St. Gaudens achieves a remarkable illusion of much greater depth through perfect draftsmanship and a complete awareness of how light and shadow flows over his surfaces as he works. It has the feeling more of that as a, of a painting than as a three-dimensional form in its ability to deceive the eye. Now, the other relief I want to discuss is what I think is one of his most technically fascinating, and that is the portrait of Samuel Gray Ward. It's a half-length portrait of a bearded man in profile, seated with his hands in his lap, 
and with a slight three-quarter turn in the torso. Now, for me personally, it's not his most amazing-looking relief. It's not one of his more dynamic or, or personal ones. It's a pretty, you know, straight-up half-length portrait. Uh, but I chose this portrait to talk about because of the extremely low relief coupled with an extremely vigorous surface. This relief is actually the lowest relief that Augustus St. Gaudens ever attempted, but you would never know it just by seeing a photograph of it. It looks much deeper than you would imagine. In fact, almost unbelievably, the relief is only an eighth of an inch deep. That's just three millimeters. But there's more to it than just its shallow depth. The textures in this jacket and in his beard and in other places, it reflects light and grabs shadow in a way that I, that I can only describe as impressionistic. How line is treated in the general contour of the figure is done as, as a painter might, thickening the line in one place while losing the contour altogether in others. The bow tie is simply an arrangement of light and shadow, it's reminiscent of how Velasquez or John Singer Sargent might have handled it. Velasquez and Sargent are both painters, of course, and it may seem odd that I'm comparing Augustus St. Gaudens' relief to painters, but there just isn't any sculptor preceding Augustus St. Gaudens to compare this work to, except by way of contrast. It's actually very difficult for me to look at the portrait of Samuel Gray Ward and imagine creating this with my hands out of clay. So how did Augustus St. Gaudens do it? How was he able to produce relief lower and with more vigor than anyone preceding him? Now, it wasn't that Augustus St. Gaudens was just better. He was producing relief in a new way, with a new technique. And that technique has a name, pâté sur pâté. That's French for paste over paste. Now, pâté sur pâté is a decorative technique developed by the Sèvres Porcelain Factory in 1850. It became a popular technique for decorating vases and pots, and how it's done is this. You, you basically, you, you make your vase in wet clay, and you allow it to dry up to a, a firm but not too dry state. And then you mix up several consistencies of slip. And for the non-sculptors out there, slip is just clay with enough water mixed in to make the clay into a paste. Now that paste can be very thin or very thick or downright watery. And then, basically what you do, you apply the slip to the firm clay vase with a paintbrush, building up very subtle forms layer by layer. These forms are made with nothing more than what would be considered by painters as an impasto. One of the really cool effects of this technique is that you apply white porcelain slip over a vase which is to be glazed a different color. So you can fade the slip, the white slip, out over the surface to the point that it becomes translucent with the colored background showing through. I've got a picture of uh, some pâté sur pâté vases on the, on the image gallery as well. So check them out. They're, they're actually quite impressive. So... Why was Augustus St. Gaudens the first to try pâté sur pâté with large work to be cast in bronze? Well, the technique was only invented in 1850, and who knows how many years passed before it was ever even noticed by sculptors in bronze. And it's not something every sculptor would be dying to try anyway. I mean, many sculptors don't work in relief at all. My hunch is that Augustus St. Gaudens was exposed to pâté sur pâté and its possibilities through his knowledge of one of the greatest workers in pâté sur pâté, Marc-Louis Solon, an artist working at the Sèvres Pottery. Now, Solon was a, a great experimenter with the technique, and he applied pâté sur pâté not just to vases, but to other objects, including using the technique to produce cameos. Using a blue background with white porcelain slip in these pâté sur pâté cameos has a good resemblance to the colors of a cameo cut in stone. So my guess is that Augustus St. Gaudens would have first heard or seen Salon's cameo work due to his interest in cameos before most other sculptors, and was the first, or at least one of the first, to apply the technique to models to be cast in bronze. The portrait of Samuel Gray Ward was made in 1881, the year after Augustus St. Gaudens returned to New York from his latest trip to Paris, and only 30 years after pâté sur pâté was invented for a completely different purpose. So using this new technique in his work, 
sometimes combining pâté sur pâté with more traditional low-relief work, Augusta St. Gaudens develops a style of relief unlike anyone else's. St. Gaudens' reliefs are as subtle as they are vigorous, with an undulating, light-catching surface and often uneven backgrounds. These works have all the ephemeral effects and bravado of a John Singer Sargent painting. Augusta St. Gaudens pushes the limits of staccato or low relief further than anyone had since probably Donatello, and for me, it's Augustus's relief work which earns him a place among the great masters of sculpture. So now let's return to Augustus St. Gaudens' biography. In 1880, he returns to New York, his wife gives birth to his son Homer, and Augustus is elected president of the Society of American Artists. And in 1881, his monument to Admiral Farragut is unveiled. Now, the monument for Admiral Farragut is worth taking a closer look at, as it reveals so much about St. Gaudens interests and influences at the time. First of all, is the figure itself, which is more or less typical of the many war memorial figures going up around the United States at the time. A realistic portrait with a lot of attention paid to meticulous detail in the uniform and military accessories. And if this figure of Augustus St. Gaudens was simply stood up on a pedestal, it would be pretty unremarkable, even if it was one of the better sculpted versions of its type. But what makes this monument a standout work, even a significant one, is the way in which it interacts with its fantastically designed pedestal, which was a collaboration, again, between Augustus St. Gaudens and his architect buddy, Stanford White. They likely had been plotting this collaboration back in Paris, as well as on their Italian trip they took together. The pedestal for the figure is carved from blue stone, meant to evoke the seas upon which Farragut sailed. From a central rectangular pillar on which the figure stands spreads two extensions to each side as we look from the front, sort of like curved wings which provide two large spaces upon which reliefs are inscribed. Now, the reliefs are allegorical figures of courage and loyalty. Next to these figures, we find a lengthy inscription in Augustus's trademark raised lettering, and below, built right into the bottom of these wing extensions slash relief panels, are benches upon which the public can sit, with their backs resting right on the inscription and relief. The entire work is raised up on a dais, with three steps leading up to these uh, built-in benches, and the dais itself has a floor of pebbles instead of a you know, regular stone platform which is another allusion to the sea. Set into this little pebble beach is a small bronze crab, upon which are inscribed the names of Augustus St. Gaudens and Stanford White. Now, the first thing that makes this a real standout work is, of course, the interplay between the figure and the pedestal. This pedestal does more than merely provide height to the figure. It gives the work an environment in which to exist. The shape of the monument as a whole has been compared to the quarterdeck of a ship, with Farragut's standing watch on top, uniform flowing in a steady wind, binoculars in hand as he gazes out to the sea. Now, of course, this interplay between sculpture and architecture isn't new. We've got examples which go back to at least the High Renaissance in Michelangelo's New Sacristy. And, of course, one of Bernini's main pursuits in his work was to blur the lines between sculpture and the setting in which it was placed. But this idea of the total work of art, the seamless combination of sculpture and architecture, well, that, that idea had sort of fallen out of favor, or at least had fallen out of practice in the 19th century. Sculpture's relationship with architecture had fallen back into a pretty subservient role, sculpture being a means of breaking up broad planes or hard lines of architecture with a flourish of form and volume. Back in the days of the Renaissance and the Baroque eras, sculpture and architecture were often practiced by the same person. But as time progressed and education became more systematic, the sister arts of sculpture and architecture had become a bit estranged. Likewise, market forces for sculpture had evolved in such a way that sculptors were no longer heavily reliant on architectural projects and monumental schemes for their bread and butter. I mean, one could become known through the exhibitions of the Paris Salon, or in America through the exhibitions of the National Academy of Design, or in Italy, one could simply open one's studio to the foreigners on the Grand Tour. 
True collaboration as equals between sculpture and architecture had become a rarity, and the Farragut Memorial is a shining example of what sort of fruits this collaboration can bear. Making it even more of a rarity is the fact that the sculpture and architecture for this work came from a sculptor and an architect, two different people, rather than one person acting as sculptor and architect, as in the examples of Michelangelo and Bernini. Stanford White and Augusta St. Gaudens would collaborate frequently for the rest of their lives, and their partnership served as an example for sculptors and architects for several following decades, reaching its height with the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition and the subsequent City Beautiful movement, both of which I will be talking about in a future podcast. You know, we sculptors today can only dream of such collaboration being common. I don't know if today's architects share that dream, but but they should. Maybe someday I'll do a podcast just on that subject of the interplay between sculptors and architects, as I think it's a huge piece of the puzzle as to why figurative sculpture is not more of a player in the general discourse of our time, and why it is so difficult to make a living as a sculptor, beyond the ubiquitous churning out of small bronze nudes to be sold at galleries. But but I digress. Whether Augustus St. Gaudens and Stanford White were inspired by Bernini in their collaboration, it's an open question. But there is no doubt that Augustus St. Gaudens learned much from the Italian Renaissance, much like the Neo-Florentine movement back in Paris did, and it wasn't simply confined to low relief. The figure of Admiral Farragut is a direct quote from Donatello. Take the binoculars out of Farragut's hand and give him a shield, and you have the exact pose of Donatello's St. George, right down to the slightly turned head to the left, and his eyes scanning the horizon. Unless you think to yourself, oh, well, there goes Jason again, everything's always about his favorite sculptor, Donatello. Well, the idea that the St. George was the inspiration for Farragut is something that hadn't actually occurred to me, but it was pointed out to me by Catherine Greenthal's fantastic book, Augustus St. Gaudens, Master Sculptor, published in 1985. It's a good read, and much of my info is coming directly from this book. And by the way, this book is available in its entirety online through the Metropolitan Museum Digital Collections, or at Google Books. So if you want to learn more about St. Gaudens, check it out. Looking beyond the influences of the Renaissance in the Farragut Memorial, we do have to note that there is something really, really new in its effect as a whole, which is much greater than the sum of its parts. This Farragut Memorial is the first significant sculpture in America that would be later lumped into a period in American art known as the Beaux-Arts style. As the name implies, it's the style of sculpture found in America after American sculptors started going to Paris to study at the École de Beaux-Arts, as something separate from the Roman influence of earlier neoclassical sculptors in America. And by the 1880s, even sculptors training in Rome and Florence had evolved away from the earlier neoclassical chokehold and were emulating the Romantics and the Symbolists and the modeling style which gave voice to these movements which had originated in Paris. And in the United States, this new style was different enough from what had come before that a distinction was felt necessary. And so this trend became known as the Beaux-Arts style. It's actually pretty identical to what happened in England at right around the same time. English Victorian neoclassicism had been infused with the new French modeling techniques and taste, producing a distinctly English version of French influence, and it too was given a a name of its own. The English art critic Edmund Goss started referring to the new sculpture in his reviews, and today we still know this short-lived century-old trend in English art as the new sculpture movement. And so, in 1881, the stage is set. In hindsight, we can see that all the elements are in place for Augustus St. Gaudens to rise to preeminence in the United States as a sculptor. With the pedigree of the latest European training, with abilities and sensibilities almost unique among his peers, with strong personal and professional connections with the leading architects and designers in the United States, and living at a time when the U.S. is moving from a me-too copycat attitude towards European sculpture to the now familiar we-are-America-we-can-do-anything attitude, the immediate future of American sculpture lay largely in Augustus St. Gaudens' hands. He's one of the several sculptors throughout history who was at the right place at the right time, and most importantly, was the right person. 
Looking closely at Michelangelo or Bernini, we can see that although they were creative geniuses, they could not have achieved what they did in a vacuum. They were born in the right place and at the right time, with the right support and the right patrons, which allowed a free reign of their genius. Though on a lesser scale, we can see that Augustus St. Gaudens is now in a similar position. And what does Augustus St. Gaudens do with all this genius and free reign? Well, we'll find out all about it in the second half of our discussion, coming up in the next episode. Well, thank you very much for listening, everyone. I hope that uh, wasn't too much of a jumbled up episode. I know I, I jumped around to a, a million different topics, but that's that's just how it goes with Augustus St. Gaudens. He was everywhere and... You know, knowing the, the context of how he worked is just is just crucial to really understanding uh, the significance of his work. And I think and I think one of the reasons that Augustus St. Gaudens isn't more well known is because we lack that context. So so thanks for slogging it through with me. Now don't forget you can check out additional content at the Sculptor's Funeral YouTube channel or on our Facebook group page as well. And while you're there, you can join in the conversation. If you have a question you've always wanted the answer to concerning sculpture, chances are good that if you ask the question there, someone will have the answer for you. And don't forget to get cracking on your logo designs for the sculptor's funeral. Get them in by December 1st if you can. You can post those to the Facebook page as well so we can all take a look. You can also subscribe to the podcast at Stitcher Mobile or on iTunes, or subscribe from any service from which you get your podcasts. That way you can receive the podcast automatically on your PC, tablet, or mobile device. And if you want to help the podcast reach other people just like you, leave a review of the podcast or give the podcast a rating on iTunes or wherever you subscribe. Check out the SculptorsFuneral.com website where you can stream the complete archives of the show for free, as always. And check out the image galleries for this and for every episode. And finally, if you feel so inclined, click on the sponsor of the podcast, Blick Art Supplies. Clicking on that link and buying from Blick helps to support the podcast, and for that, I do thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.